I want to turn to our scripture today and to read from the New Testament uh, two chapters, uh, two sections of chapters. But we're going to start with Mark chapter 5 and the first 20 verses. And our text will be Matthew 8, 28 through 34. They both record the same thing as does Luke chapter 8, the exorcism of a legion of devils by our Savior. But Mark chapter 5, that's the longer of the passages, in verses 1 through 20. <clears throat> the setting here is Jesus in the boat with the disciples. They were coming to the sea, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And remember that Jesus had just stilled the storm, the waves and the wind with his word, peace be still. And now Jesus will exercise his lordship over demons and the souls and bodies of men as he comes to this place, the country of the Gadarenes. Hear the word of God. And they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. When he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. He was a wild beast. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine, pigs, was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told him how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim a Decapolis, that is, that region of the Gadarenes called Decapolis because there were ten cities there, all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. We want to read now from Matthew chapter 8, from which we'll be preaching primarily, though alluding to Mark 5 and Luke chapter 8. Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 uh, through 34, the end of the chapter. When he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a good way off from them there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. 
And those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. So we are familiar with the narrative of this exorcism of a legion of devils from a, one possessed by them. Jesus has just stilled the storm on the sea, and the disciples were amazed, and they say, what sort of man is this? Now Jesus would reveal himself to be the Lord of, over demons as well, and they're truly going to be led, as we should be, to say, what sort of a God is this who can and, and has uh, power over the devils themselves? Now there are, however, several things that might get in the way of our really appreciating this text not only, but believing the gospel in this text. And the first thing is, we might have a critical sort of spirit towards the gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which record this one event, this historical event, but in different ways. There are differences among the narratives, you may have noticed some. For example, the location where they land on the other side of the Sea of Galilee is described variously. One calls it the Gergesenes, or the region of the Gergesenes. Another calls it Gadara. And they, uh, we might be tempted to say, well, there's discrepancies here, so how do we know we should believe uh, in one text or another, or neither of them, because they differ and they're even contradictory. Besides that, the number of men who are demon-possessed in the narratives is described variously. Our text has two men who come to Jesus, and Mark and Luke have one man whose name is Legion who comes to Jesus. Besides that, there's different descriptions of the men, different words that they say, and even different words that Jesus says. So what are we to make of this? The critic looks at the Gospels as he does the entire New Testament and Old, with criticism, seeking to look down upon the various places where there seems to be contradiction. But we must not be critical, but believing. There is explanation, there is legitimate explanation for these differences, and simply it is because God would record in different ways from the perspectives first of Matthew, then of Mark, then of Luke, the, the same thing that happened so that we have a fullness of revelation here, not a disjointedness and certainly not contradiction. For example, the one way we would explain the fact that Matthew has two men and Mark and Luke have one man whose name is Legion is simply the way we explain the fact that the gospel narratives also speak of two angels at the tomb of Jesus, but only one speaks. And so we have here a a, uh, a head devil, as it were, a head demon-possessed one, who is really at the center of attention of Jesus, even though there's two. But the head devil has a name even. His name is Legion. And this is on the focused and the foreground of the narratives of the other two texts. But there is two men, demon-possessed. There is, however, the one whose name is Legion, on whom we will focus as well. So we may not have a critical spirit here, but understand, this is the one word of God, and there is harmony, and there is completion and fullness in the different narratives. Besides that, we can be tempted, especially with this miracle, to be sensational, to be those who are focusing on the miracle. After all, there's record in the New Testament of Jesus having much to do with devils. One here, one there a general description of his casting out devils here and there, but nothing said. But here, 6,000 of them, that's the number of a legion, a Roman army. There's so many of them, they call them a legion here. Jesus casts out with a word. And the devils themselves, they come and they worship Jesus. This is, this is remarkable. We might be tempted to sensationalize the thing and just focus on the devils and maybe claim the power today to cast out devils even as Jesus has. Many do this to their, um, to their hurt, and we ought not to sensationalize the narrative. Or we might do this, and the opposite, the flip side of being sensational, we might be those who are carnatical, as I would call it, carnal, unbelieving, 
And this is the reason why the whole world doesn't get this narrative in the Bible, because they don't believe in the unseen world, the world of devils, the world of principalities and powers. They don't believe in the unseen God or this world of demons. And so they're entrapped by the lie that what you see is what you get, and all the while the devil's laughing. So we may not be those who are carnal and unbelieving, but here we're taught front and center there's a world with devils filled. Watch out. They are those uh, hosts of the demon himself, the prince of this world, who would undermine your faith, if possible, and who are held by Satan himself in his throes. So we ought not to be critical, sensational, carnal, nor ought we to be, beloved, egotistical. There's a danger here that we speak and we think of one demon-possessed legion. And we say, well, yeah, he was in a bad way. He must have engaged in seances, or maybe he was all into Halloween when he was young, and now he's, he's into this uh, idea that we can call on devils, and he himself is occupied by a devil. And we can think, well, those Gadarenes as well, why were they there? They wouldn't have Jesus for them, and we're we can end up being a little bit better than them, we think, in our minds. Oh, beloved, let us not be egotistical here, full of I, full of the ego, full of me, and I think that I don't need Jesus to protect me from devils. Let's not do that, because after all, and here's another perspective we can have in this text, we can be materialistic. Those who are given to the things of the world, as it seems the Gadarenes were when they said, go away, Jesus, you're hurting our prophets from the pigs. And we can do that sometimes too, maybe often. Go away, Jesus, from my business transaction here because I'm, I'm dealing with this thing and you and your word, you're going to cause me a loss of profit because you would rather me be virtuous than rich. Well, all of those things would cause us to miss the great revelation here of Jesus himself. Here we have Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and the Savior, the Savior from sin and devils, our Savior from sin and devils in this miracle, the exorcism of Legion. We want to consider three points, Legion meeting as Lord, exorcism and salvation, and then the new Legion that's created by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. So in the country of the Gadarenes, the other side of Galilee, there was where Gad and Reuben and half the tribe of Manasseh had asked for their inheritance to be. We come across Jesus meeting a people ruled by devils. There is, first of all, the man possessed by the devils. And his uh, tag along, I suppose, the one who's not named, the other man in Matthew, but this one man, especially Legion, we want to focus on him. He is one who is called possessed of a devil. He's not a maniac. He's not an insomniac. He's not insane. He is a demonic person. And this is what he has become because there's been this occupation of his soul by the devil. This was real. The devil is a real and evil being, and he has demons who are fallen angels who rebelled with him in the beginning and who came to this earth to work us woe. This one is named Legion. This is his, his, his nickname, I suppose, because there's so many devils that have occupied him. And the Legion, again, as I said, is a reference to the number of uh, troops in a Roman uh, group, an army of 6,000 or so. Apparently, they're ruled by a head devil who's the spokesman, an unclean spirit, someone on the behalf of Satan himself. Now, it is a question how this would have occurred. We read uh, in the narratives, not Matthew, but this man had been a man of the city. This one now demon-possessed, whose name is Legion, he might have had a reputation. 
And one day, and maybe in the process of time, he's changing, and he's now occupied by these devils, and he becomes an entirely different man, even like a wild beast. How does this occur? How did this occur? This occupation of this man's soul, his very soul, by devils. Well, perhaps by lavish sin. Perhaps this man was given over to calling and trying to conjure up the dead by witches. Perhaps, again, he thought it funny at first to watch the movies about all the devils and all of the exorcisms and, and all of the things that would haunt souls and, and make fun of these things, but maybe then dabble in the occult and finally give himself over to this, this power. There's people like that, you know. They're like that today. They are not satisfied with their life. They're not satisfied with their, their lack of abilities to stand out. And so they go into this other world, this realm of the demons. And they think that there's power there and some connection with power and maybe predicting the future and so on. Well, this is the case that there are specific times in history that demon possession seems to stand out. I'm uh, referring to the time in, of, to which we are looking at in Matthew, in our series of sermons there, the dawn of the New Testament age. At that time, demons were out in spades, as it were. They were all over the place. And D, uh, Jesus' ministry included a lot of it casting out devils and those possessed of the devils saving them. Uh, Jesus, after all, was come... And the very first promise and the fulfillment of it would be that he crushes the head of Satan. So this is the way in history and in the sacred account of history that Jesus shows that he's the Messiah who crushes the principalities and powers, the unseen hierarchy of the hosts of hell. And so that he is truly the Savior because he can overcome this host of hell. And we read as well in Revelation 20, that there's a time when the devil himself is bound a thousand years. And then at the end of time, Revelation 20 tells us, the devil will be loosed and the demons will come from the abyss of hell to, to work woe upon the earth and to deceive many, even if possible, the church. There is the Antichrist who's associated with the, who is the devil's man the ape of Jesus, the imitator of all things good and of the God who's good, who stands in the temple, in the realm of the religious, seeking to deceive even the elect of God. Now, we may not be so familiar with devils now, but we ought to be. We ought to be those who are praying to be kept from devils, praying that there would be this uh, terrific protection by God in these last times from devils and our children from devils and demon possession, if that were possible. It's not for the elect, more on that later, but we ought to be keenly aware. This is terrible. The influence of devils is not good, not exciting, not something that gives us a significance in life, but it's something that destroys this is seen in this man. The man here uh, was affected by devils. He had lived in the city. Now he's filled with devils. A long time, the Bible says. The devils are having his way with his mind, his will, his speech, his appearance, his attitude, everything. He lives, in fact, among the tombs, the graveyards of the day. That's fitting. The devil is the devil of death. He works death, and he's all about killing people. He's driven out there by the devils, and he turns out to be wild and fierce. This is noted in the accounts. He is supernaturally strong. That is, not your ordinary Hercules, even. Nobody can chain him up. Nobody can keep him, no matter how much they would pin him down and chain him. No matter, he is of the devil, and he is uh, one possessed of the devil's strength. 
reminds us that we cannot resist the devil in ourselves. Don't think that you can resist the devil in yourselves. Don't say, I'm stronger than the devil. Never say that. You're weak, beloved. I'm weak. We need the strong one, even Jesus Christ. So he's wild. He's wild in his mind. He would scream, children, night and day. He'd rush toward people and threaten them. And no one dared go near to this man called Legion and to his crony, the other man that was there. So he was wild and fierce and he was altogether inhuman, if that can be, even though he's still a human being. A terrible example, this, of demon possession. Besides that, he's evil. He's against people. That's what evil is, to be against people and against God and against yourself. This man, in fact, was suicidal. That's, what, that's the origin, we should know, of suicides. They are influenced by the devil, and we ought to keep ourselves from that. If only for that, it's of the devil to destroy yourself. He would uh, prick his skin with sharp stones. He'd also harm people if he could. He was also against God. He hates Jesus. This is striking. When he meets Jesus, he recognizes him as the Son of the Most High God, as the Christ of God. There is amazing. This devil reflects the truth of devils, that is, what they know. They are greater theologians and more accurate than a lot of ministers today. They know of Jesus, that he's the Son of the Most High God. They know of Jesus, that he's the Christ. They know that he's the judge and that there's a time appointed when he shall judge. And this devil knows it all. This one knows it all. Again, to put to shame many theologians today. He tempts Jesus, it appears, to swear an oath that he would not tempt him before the time, before the appointed time, before judgment day. Isn't that striking? The devils know, Legion knew, that there's a time when they're going to be judged and cast into hell, and yet they keep on in their devilish ways. Go figure, you can't figure out a devil. So the devil has his motives in approaching Jesus. He never has a good one. The truth of the devil is always the lie. The lie of the devil is always the lie. Nothing good to say. And in fact, his motives here in asking Jesus to send himself and his legion into the swine Maybe, and no doubt is, no doubt is, with a bad motive, maybe, so that it can be he keeps the rest of the people from believing in Jesus because by casting them into the swine, they will be destroyed in the sea and their money will be gone from those swine that they're raising. That would keep people from worshiping Jesus if he's simply revealing himself as someone who's going to destroy their business. Maybe tell them not to work or whatever like that. Who would believe in a person like that or, or vote for a person like that? And so Jesus here is someone who's recognized by the devils and especially that one legion. But I do want to point out to you that there's not only one possessed of a devil in Gadarene and Gadara, but there's a whole country that is ruled by the devil. There's a difference here that I would make. There's demon possession, and there's simply being ruled by a devil. And this can happen to God's people even. I do not believe for a minute that the Holy Spirit occupied children of God can also be possessed of a devil or possessed by a devil. The Holy Spirit will have no fellowship with devils. Be sure, beloved, the Holy Spirit's in us, no devils will ever occupy us as they did this man called Legion. However, the devil can rule us. The devil is to be resisted, according to the Bible, and we ought to be careful with regard to his influence. The Gadarenes, who come out later when Jesus exorcises the devil and who causes them to go into the pigs and, uh, so that the pigs are destroyed, they come out and they protest. Basically, when they're coming out, they're led out by this event of the exorcism and the casting of the devils into the swine and their destruction, and the, and the, 
and the uh, swine herders tell them they're let out because they want to put an end to this Jesus influence if it's going to destroy their, their business of raising swine and selling them. Gadarenes, in fact, are ruled by sin. Sin is the devil's prince. Romans 6 tells us that sin rules over those who are not ruled over by Jesus and not redeemed by him. That's the terrible uh, agent of destruction that the devil uses, sin. Sin is like a mighty tyrant in all of those totally depraved, fallen in Adam's sinners and not raised up again in Jesus. This is what the Gadarenes are. They are, in fact, examples to all of us, this first century people and nation, beholding Jesus and not wanting him, of everything that is worldly. They have no concern and no rejoicing over the man from whom the legion of devils were cast out. They don't welcome him back so much as to resist Jesus. They're not interested in Jesus because they don't think that they're going to get anything out of him except a headache. In fact, they're more interested in pigs and profit than salvation. They reject Jesus. In them, I believe, beloved, is the unclean spirit of this day, our day, materialism and idolatry and selfishness. Imagine that. Jesus comes to your land, and he does mighty miracles, and you start judging Jesus' miracles. Maybe the miracle included the destruction of part of your life and your wherewithal that was uh, uh, something that was ill-gotten Ill gain for you. You don't like that. You don't like the fact that Jesus, in the place of that ill-gotten gain, has given you the, ga the gain of salvation. He has presented to you that salvation that is in him. You don't like that. So these Gadarenes are ruled over by the devils. And that's the way it is today. The world is full of cultured devils very subtle influence of the devils because the cultured devils who promote music and who promote legislation and, and all of these things that are going to cure us of evils and so on, they, they, they appear good. In fact, in this world, the cultured devils, the ones who are the ones who are wealthy and artistic and so on, they're the devil's masterpieces, really. They're not wild men, they're cultured men. They're cultured despisers. They're the ones who criticize a narrative such as this, who are so materialistic that they have no room for the other world, no room for the above world of heaven and heavenly things, no understanding of blessing that is in Jesus Christ. They, they don't, well, if they do understand it, they, they don't like it for a minute. So they'll sing their songs and they'll sing us all the way to hell because they love company in their hellish existence. Their, theirs is a cloak of good that's covering a skeleton of evil. They live in the tombs of man's own creation, the Babylons, the Babels of man's cities and culture, all the edifices to man. It's all of the devil. We ought to understand that as we live in this world. The culture of man, yes, indeed, there's good songs that they write and good poetry that they have and good inventions that we can use, but the culture of man is at bottom of the devil, and we ought to be careful about this. It may be, in fact, that the ones who came to Jesus from Gadara and who said, get out of here, that they were apostate Jews. That's debatable. It is a question whether these people with the swine, which were unclean, were Gentiles or Jews. But it could very well be that there's a remnant of Jewry on the other side of Galilee, on the outside of Jewry proper, that apostatized. And now they were buying and selling and trafficking in things that were forbidden to Jews, swine, unclean animals, pictures of sin. And so they could be the apostate ones, and then we understand they represent 
anything that falls away from truth even today. The people who come out to meet Jesus are the ones who once received Jesus and at least received the promises of the Old Testament then and now the New Testament in the church. There are people, maybe Reformed, maybe Presbyterian, that are in bondage now to pleasing men in their worship and in their witness and so that as long as they have the numbers, as long as they have the influence, then they must be doing what is right. This is all something that's devilish when the same churches reject Jesus. How terrible when churches and Christians so influenced by this world become so occupied with this world, even a worldly gospel, that they forget Jesus, the Savior from sin and devils. Oh, beloved, I move on. Second part of my first point is that these all subjects of devils meet Jesus who's the Lord and judge of the universe. This is a, such a lovely revelation here. Jesus comes. He's just stilled the storm. Just said in that stilling the storm, I am Lord over the wind and the waves. No reason to worry. I'm God with you in the boat. Now, in a word, go, be gone to devils. He shows he's Lord over the greatest powers that there are besides God. Jesus is the one who is recognized by the demons themselves as the Lord. And they bow to him. They worship him amazingly. And he's recognized as the judge. There's a time appointed when he will judge, as the book of Acts tells us. He's recognized as the sovereign one. He's the holy God in their midst whose eyes flash flaming fire and judgment upon the sins of men. Jesus shows his power. He shows his lordship in the meeting with the Gadarenes, with the demoniac. It's amazing. This demoniac who would seek to harass any human being who would come in his territory when he spies Jesus from afar, he runs to Jesus and he bows down and he worships. Uh, you might think maybe Jesus is in trouble here on the outward appearance. And imagine that, a gathering, seeing this, this devil-possessed person going to Jesus. Say, oh no, this guy's going to be in trouble now. But no, the guy is compelled to worship Jesus. And Jesus then commands the unclean spirit to come out. The devil recognizes this great opponent, this one before whom he's perilous, and he says, uh, you wouldn't do this before the appointed time, would you? And don't cast me into the abyss and into eternal perdition now. And, and please, uh, what about these swine? What about these swine? Let me, let me just go into them. Well, it's striking here. It seems as if Jesus is doing the behest of the, the devils. They say, let's go to the swine. And, and their motive is, is always devilish, and perhaps it was to keep others from being converted because Jesus will be seen as someone who destroys their living, swine selling. But beloved, I believe with all my heart that Jesus was not doing the bidding of the, of the devils. In fact, he was leading them and ruling over them in their devilish things, though not, of course, causing them to be devils, but their king, their lord, and ruling over them so that they would serve his purposes. What was the purpose of Jesus in the casting out of the, uh, or causing the devils to go out of the person into the swine? Well, in the first place, Jesus didn't let the devils occupy another person. That should be noted. But he did say, here's the fit place for devils, swine. He said this in so many words. He thought this in so many thoughts. And he did this, beloved, exactly so that the Gadarenes themselves would be led out of the, their cities in holy, unholy horror 
at the fact that all their prophets were gone, and he was leading them as well to be judged by him in addition to the legion of devils. I believe that Jesus' purpose in going to Gadara was judgment, the judgment of legion, the judgment of the Gadarenes who had filled up their cup of iniquity. So Jesus is leading them in their own materialistic and sinful ways and hardening them so that they reject him. Jesus is Lord here. He's not being frustrated here. He's commanding all things here. And when the people come out, they will show just where their heart is at. And they will say, go, and Jesus will judge them and condemn them because he condemns all those who reject him. So Jesus is judging, and he is not frustrated here when he departs and goes from their country. And this we ought to remember today and in all the purposes of God that are being affected today. Jesus is going about being Lord, being judge as well as being savior. He accomplishes his purpose in the army of heaven and the army on the earth. They're all his. He's going about, and not for one minute, is he ever frustrated in his purposes? He's going about and he's gathering through the preaching of the gospel and through the witness of the church, his own for whom he died. Not one more or less. Going about to gather the lost sheep. Going about to protect them from devil's and to care for them forever. And this leads to this, the exorcism and the salvation. Jesus shows here he's Lord and Savior. He comes to crush the devil's head, to put to naught all of his works, and to save the seed of humanity he's chosen, the seed of the woman, the children of God. He will do this on the cross. Colossians tells us that he crushes the principalities and powers on the cross, as well as uh, Hebrews chapter 2. By his indwelling spirit, he sanctifies the people of God and he indwells them and he gathers them and defends them. This is seen in the salvation of the demoniac. There is something called exorcism here. Out of the soul of this demonic uh, human being, this demon-possessed demon, come all the troops of the devil. At Jesus' word, be gone, go, get out just at his word. At his word, the Holy Spirit comes in. That's not said in the text. It's not said that the man is born again, but surely he is. Demon possessed, not possessed of the Holy Spirit, not someone who is a child of God. Now, he sits at Jesus' feet. Now, all he wants is Jesus. Now when Jesus goes in the boat, he wants to be there. He wants to serve this one who set him free from the devil and from sin. He's in his right mind, the texts say. In your right mind, the mind of the Word of God. He's at peace. No devils anymore are going to plague him from within. Even though he'll have to resist the devil from without, and the fears he'll have to wrestle with of maybe being possessed once again, though it's impossible. He's now owned by God and possessed of the Holy Spirit. Now he's Jesus, man. And he wants to go wherever Jesus goes and to be there for him. As a revelation here of sheer mercy. People want to think that salvation is of God and of man. God says otherwise. It's impossible for someone to choose for God if they're demon-possessed or if they're ruled over by devils. It's impossible for a totally depraved person to choose for God. God must set him free, and then he chooses for God or she chooses for God. But first, there has to be the exorcism of the devils or the overthrowing of the power of Satan so that there's this new birth this new heart, this new mind. Mark 5, 19 tells us that Jesus had had compassion on this one. He had compassion on him. He didn't have compassion on the worldly Gadarenes, 
but he had compassion on this one who was far worse off being possessed of a whole legion, not of Roman soldiers, but of hellions in his soul. He had compassion on him. That's love to the, the needy. He showed that he was wise and mighty, not to the socially acceptable, but to the devil-possessed one who ran around naked in the tombs. That's what Jesus does, beloved, to you and to me. He has compassion on us. That's why we're here. We're those who are given over to devils, and we would be if it were in ourselves, but Jesus has compassion on us. And he rules over us so that we're his and we want to be his. This is the kind of mercy that God shows to all of his people and all times. What a great salvation. Don't miss it. Your salvation is depicted here in the exorcism of Legion. Your salvation. Your salvation. From nothing less or different than hell itself and its influence, from all of the smoke and mirrors and deceit and lies of devilish politicians, devilish worldliness, and all the spirits of the age have been delivered. Think of that. Think of that. This is the gospel of our salvation. Jesus is pointing to the worth of his cross. He's pointing and leading up toward the end of his ministry as he proceeds here in Matthew, and we're following this along, to everybody believing that we need a cross. We need him to die for our devilish sins. We need him to take on himself the guilt of, God, of our sins for us. We need him in our place because we're held by devils otherwise. And this is for the creation of a new legion. God has his own legion in the land of the devils. This is the world that God sees in this land of the Gadarenes. It's ruled by devils and the prince of darkness himself. But God is saying in this, in this miracle, and Jesus goes, permit, uh, uh, performs the miracles, and then he departs. He's showing us there's a church in the land. There's a church in the land of the devils. There's a church in our land. There's a church in every land in all the places that Jesus visits with the gospel and where he saves his own. There's a church among the materialists and the atheists and, and the transgender people. There's a church even in America today. There's a church, the worldwide church of God, not the denomination that people want to call it, but what God calls it, my people from every nation, tribe, and tongue, recovered from the devil, from the prince of darkness grim, recovered because I have sent the captain of the host, Jesus Christ. And there's a number that no man can number. She shall be gathered, established, defended, and preserved, and the devils will flee at his command. Jesus is the king and the savior of his church. It's seen in this liberated demoniac. He's told to go back to his friends. Isn't that striking? And to tell them of what great things God has done for him. Don't you love that? We would call that anachronistically reformed theology. Jesus teaches reformed theology, but of course his theology is far more perfect than ours. But we have it, beloved. We've been given it. The same truth. God saves sinners. Look, here's the message. Behold what God has done for me. Not behold what I do and what God does. Together we're a good team. Not behold what God, who's my co-pilot, does in flying my plane. Behold what God has done for you what God must do for you, or you're lost, or you're a half-devil, or you're a fake. Behold what God, and you tell him that. Now, beloved, sometimes I think we'd rather be Baptist because then we would look for some experience we had. 
And so someday when the devils came out or when the rule of the devil was so markedly squashed in our life that we just threw everything out that was ever a tool, uh, an instrument of, of, of hell. We threw out our television. We threw out our iPods. We, we stopped this and that habit. We stopped smoking for Jesus' sake. We want that experience, that day, that moment. Oh, beloved, we have the covenant of grace that says God himself is with us even at early on to make us his family and to give us fruit early on. And we don't need a certain kind of experience to be assured of this stuff. We need the word of God and our life right now in light of it to say to people, look at what God has done for me. Look at how he's raised me. Look at the nurture that he's given to me by godly parents. Look at the church he's given to me. Look at the word of God and the ears of God that he's given to me to hear and the knees to bend and the heart to love him. You don't need an experience for that, beloved. You have the word of God and the spirit of God working in you to believe that word of God. And then, yes, that's your experience. But shaped by truth in ordinary things and in ordinary ways that God leads you to repent and believe and to raise your children or to be content without children, to be single, to be married, to be this or that or the other person with a calling. That's a calling. Jesus didn't give him any directions as demoniac now exorcised of the devil. He just gave him a canon, the word of the Savior. Go and tell them what great things God did to you. We would come with the Bible and come with our own knowledge of that in our own life and we'd say, look at what God has done for me. Look what he says in this word is true of my future. True of my past, true of my Jesus. You see, Jesus is making here a living testimony here. He doesn't send him back with a Bible even. Isn't that striking? He doesn't say, here, I have in my pocket and in my uh, briefcase a copy of Isaiah, the prophet, or a copy of the latest theologian that really gets it right about me. No, Jesus doesn't do that. He says to the man, the man of the city, the man of the tombs, the man now of Christ, you go back and you be the Bible. You be the word of God. You be what I say in this world. That I love sinners and even demon-possessed people. You be my word in your flesh with your weaknesses to be sure, but with my strength now and my presence now, even though I'm going away, I'll be with you. That's what he says to us. You see that? Hear that? He's sending you and he sends me. Nothing like a living testimony of the grace of God also today. So that... We don't approach a text like this critically or materialistically or egotistically or unbelievingly or sensationalistically, but Christologically. We believe in the Christ who is Jesus. We believe in the Lamb and the blood. We trust in that. We preach that. And we trust also in the power of that word of the gospel to make witnesses to God in this age, even in this dark age, where everything seems to be going to hell. Beloved, you're here so that others might go to heaven with you. You're here to testify as a church of a heaven-bound people because of the Savior who came once to this earth and visited Grand Rapids and called out of Grand Rapids his own demon-possessed or ruled by devils. That's you. That is I. That's me. We're all in this together because Christ is with us together. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for being our God and Savior. 
for being our God and Savior over all devils and devilish things, devilish people. We thank you, Lord, for this. This is the gospel of your mercy to us, the gospel of salvation for sinners here in one event spoken of and now declared. Lord, may we go forth and be those in this land of bondage, in this new Egypt of the 21st century, this world, this Egyptian devilish world, and call the people of God to come out. Lord, we pray, use us in this day, whatever our calling, that we may call sinners to you and know your peace. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen.